Hi. Um, first of all, I wanted to really say thank you for inviting me to your cool conference here. Uh, I know, um, being from the Apache Software Foundation, I'm not actually part of the Linux Foundation, but I think uh, both of our foundations can profit a lot from each other, and I really hope that this talk will help sort of build some bridges um, for future collaborations. Um, so, let us get started with, uh, with this talk. Um, first of all, who am I? Well, my name is Christopher Dutz. I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Mapped. Um, there I mainly work on uh, the, the direct communication with um, building automation systems. Um, but besides that, I am a, a total open source enthusiast. So most of my time goes to all sorts of different open source projects. Um, this has made me committer in really a lot of uh, Apache projects um, and also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, what honors me most is that uh, currently I'm serving as vice president of the Apache PLC4X top level project. Um, if you want to follow me, um, so sort of, this is where I post uh, short versions of uh, what I achieved uh, and, uh, well, also a little fun stuff. Um, just follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and that's where I usually, uh, it's sort of the, the joke-free part uh, where I usually just uh, describe uh, a bit of technical facts behind what I'm working on. Yeah, so let's uh, get started. What are we going to be talking about today? First of all, uh, I won't be expecting that all of you know what Apache plc for x is, so I'll just give, give a little introduction into what it is. Um, I'll show you a little example of uh, some uh, communication uh, workflows. Um, and uh, show you what challenges uh, come up with a project like PLC4X in this um, sector. Um, I'll show you what we came up with to solve these problems. Uh, we name it NSPEC. Um, and I'll show you what, what this little system uh, produces uh, as output. It's sort of a code generation framework, and uh, so I'll, I'll show you what it generates. Um, also, um, I'll give you a little very uh, brief uh, introduction into our test frameworks because, well, generating code uh, is one thing uh, and testing stuff is something completely different. Um, we have plans for generating even more parts of our uh, code, uh, so I'll give you a little uh, explanation on what we're planning on uh, adding in the future. And then comes the part that I'm really happy about because uh, I would really love to see some more collaboration between our communities. Uh, so I went through the Linux Foundation projects and tried to identify places where I think uh, working together really would make sense. So, let's get started with plc for x Well, this is the project statement. Um, at Apache, every project sort of has uh, this one statement that uh, identifies it. Uh, let me just jump over here. Um, that identifies it, and uh, well, in case of plc for x is, well, plc for x is a set of libraries for communicating with industrial programmable logic controllers using a variety of protocols, but with a shared API. And I'd like to lay emphasis on this last part because, but with a shared API is what makes a plc for x really unique. Um, right now, uh, as you can see in the background image, we have lo loads, of, it's sort of like, like this in the, the automation industry, we have hundreds of different uh, protocols. They all share different, um, or they all have different workflows or ways things are done. Uh, and integrating all of this into sort of a shared API is actually something quite difficult. So, um, let me just go over here a bit. Um, yeah, so our project website is at uh, plc4x.apache.org um, and the, the goal of the project, as I mentioned, is writing software for any type of PLC. Um, the cool thing is when changing the PLC, uh, only the configuration needs to be adjusted. Um, if anybody of you uh, remembers how it was writing uh, applications for um, uh, Java applications that communicate with databases before JDBC. Um, well, you, you really had to sort of tear apart the application if you switch from uh, MySQL to Oracle or back or whatever. Uh, you always needed to change your program. 
um, with JDBC, they introduced sort of the, the concept of a connection string, uh, and uh, the queries were uh, in string form too. And let's say, to keep it simple, that's sort of what we're trying to do uh, with PLC for X. Think of it as a JDBC for industrial automation. Uh, we have a strong growing number of uh, supported protocols. And uh, starting uh, last uh, two years, we also uh, had a strong growing number uh, of programming languages that we support. Um, we uh, also um, sometimes even support features with the project uh, with which uh, protocols actually don't support. Just as a little example, um, Modbus, the, the Modbus protocol, it generally only allows you to read Boolean values, the coils, or, or short values, uh, the, the registers. Um, but a lot of, um, a lot of uh, companies sort of built on top of that to allow sending a real value, uh, uh, um, uh, a floating point value, um, based on four bytes. So it automatically joins together to, um, to registers uh, and uh, s then sends a real value in two registers. Uh, plc Frex supports that. Uh, we also support, for example, um, subscriptions uh, on protocols that actually don't support su subscriptions by uh, doing all of this uh, subscription stuff in the background. Um, another thing that plc Frex is really strong with is uh, the, the strong growing number of integration modules. So um, while it was uh, sort of normal in the, in the early 2000s that uh, you, you took a driver or, or a tool and you built the integration for the thing that you wanted, uh, that's sort of not how things work today. Everybody sort of expects uh, to have integration modules to make it really simple to integrate. Uh, and plc for comes with a really strong number, a strong growing number of uh, available integration modules. So, for example, uh, Apache Kafka, um, Apache NiFi. We have for Agent, for Camel. We have, we have all sorts of um, different integration modules. And uh, well, let's say uh, I'd really be happy to see some Linux Foundation uh, project integration modules uh, there in the near future. Okay. So, um, plc for supports um, these uh, different types of operations. Well, in general, just reading stuff, writing stuff. Well, that's the, the, the basic stuff. Um, subscriptions, well, we have cyclic. So, it says, like, like uh, please give me this value every 100 milliseconds without having to ask. Or, please give me uh, this value uh, whenever it changes. Uh, or, uh, in PLC world, uh, we also have events and alarms. So let's say if somebody hits the big fat off button of the machine, uh, you don't want to pull that. That has to be an event. Uh, well, uh, our subscription API supports that. What we're currently working hard on, and that's why, why we have these little red hammers behind them, um, is discovery and browse. Uh, discovery is sort of, you can think of, uh, you have this little device and you stick it into your network and you hit the discovery button and it just finds out every PLC that it is able to detect and uh, as a result just gives you the connection um, uh, information that you need to connect to that device. Browse on the other side is if you've already got a connection uh, and you want to know which resources does this have. Uh, let's say browse is definitely the most complex part. Um, I think uh, I'd say 60% uh, of the size of the Go KNX driver is mainly focusing on the browse functionality because uh, well, these protocols usually don't even support browse functionality and we have to um, be smart with it and uh, try to find out sort of like, it's sort of automated detective work what we're doing there. Um, but this is definitely, uh, those last two parts are definitely the parts that uh, separate plc for x from any other solution that I know of. So, let's have a look at how um, a, a typical plc for go project looks like. Well, this is just a sort of the Go version of the API. Um, well, first of all, everything is, uh, uh, is about the driver manager. Uh, so this is what handles all of the connections. Uh, so in Go, uh, we, we register uh, a driver. Um, so in this case, uh, we register the S7 driver. Um, 
Uh, and then we ask the connection ma manager to please uh, give us a connection. Uh, in this case, it's going to be an S7 uh, connection on that IP. And you can up here you can register many drivers. Um, in Java, this happens automatically. Uh, so everything that it finds in the class path is automatically registered. With Go, we decided to do this manually because uh, it just reduces the size of the output. Uh, so, assuming you, you're, you're building a product that s should support, well, 10 or 20 different protocols, well, you just have 10 or 20 of these registers up here, and then you just continue from here on, say, get connection, and as soon as it sees S7, it's going to ask the S7 driver, um, get a connection, it's going to wait till it gets a connection, um, um, going to make sure that the connection is going to be closed at the end. Um, and now comes that part that um, happens on, well, we try to keep the API or the process of reading information sort of the same for every uh, supported uh, operating uh, programming language. So what we do is we get a read request builder and we add queries or fields uh, to that. Uh, so in this case, we give a uh, we, we, we name a field, well, this is sort of a stupid name field, uh, and we give it an address. And uh, this address, we try to keep as uh, in line with uh, industrial standards as possible. So this highlighted section is exactly as you would get it from a TIA portal, the, the engineering software you use for programming S7 devices. Uh, we added at the end uh, um, a suffix that tells the type because the address itself doesn't really contain type information so we had to add that uh, because for the S7 device it doesn't really care if it's sort of uh, a real value, it's a 4-byte signed integer, it's a 4-byte unsigned integer or even a 46-bit boolean array. It's sort of like all the same for it but as we care uh, about the type at the end we need to sort of convert this information back uh, so that's why we have uh, the type at the end to make it explicit. So here we're executing the read request and that will return uh, uh, a channel in, in Go. Uh, so this is all sort of blocking code. Uh, you can make it a lot simpler, but just for explaining things, I think this is a, a lot simpler. Um, so here we're waiting for the read request result. Uh, if everything was fine, uh, we're going to check if uh, the response code was okay. Um, if it was, uh, well, we'll just out get the get the value um, from it and output that on the screen. Um, so as you can see, this code would look exactly the same uh, if we were running it against an OPC UA uh, device, a Modbus device. It doesn't really matter. Every For every uh, type of device plc for x supports, this would look exactly the same. The only thing that would be different would be uh, the connection strings and the address strings. And to show you what's happening behind the scenes, um, the red boxes uh, are sort of what the API or what the user does yeah so you can see well he's initially not connected and he, well he wants to connect so that's what when uh, when he calls get connection this is what's happening in the background uh, when he does a when he executes a read request uh, over here this is what uh, what what actually happens so he he says uh, yeah he issues a read request well and he gets back a read response everything in between just happens magically. Um, and as you can see, uh, just as an example for, for the S7 protocol, uh, during this connection uh, this uh, connection procedure here, some uh, parameters are um, agreed upon. Uh, one of them is the, the size of the packet. Uh, and uh, the second one is how many requests in parallel can the PLC queue up um, before starting to discard them. Uh, usually it's uh, if you've got an S7-1200, it's three parallel requests, and I think it's 240 bytes uh, per request. So if, in this case, we're getting a large read request in, and that has to be split up into four uh, different um, read requests. Uh, as I said, it can only queue up three at once, so the first three go out immediately, uh, and the fourth one is queued up 
right until we get the first read response from any of these. And as soon as that happens, well, then we can fire off uh, the, the fourth uh, request. And as soon as all four come back, well, we join the information back together to the read response and uh, send that to the client. Um, so Modbus, for example, doesn't even support multiple uh, items in a request, but uh, the user doesn't notice that because plc just does all the magic uh, behind the scenes. So what are the challenges with this? Um, well, initially when I started plc uh, I think it was five years ago, um, I wrote all of the drivers in Java, but I knew this was not going to be uh, how it will be till the end because it was always planned to support multiple languages, and that's why we called the project plc for x and not plc for j um, The difficult part with all of this is usually um, finding out how things work, how uh, reverse engineering the protocols. So if you've done that once, actually writing the driver, that's the easy part. Uh, but we knew that uh, writing manual hand handwriting uh, drivers in many languages, well, that's just not going to happen. So code generation was planned from the start. And uh, I'm not one of these folks who thinks, uh, well, if I didn't write it myself, it just sucks. So I had a lot of, uh, had a look at a lot of different approaches. I think in the end it was something near 10 uh, different frameworks for serialization and transmitting data that I had a look at. Um, just as, but the, the stupid thing was all of these approaches sort of con concentrated uh, fully on how do I get an object or an object structure from A to B um, without it being changed, but they don't really lay emphasis on how is the format of the message that goes on the wire. So as an example, um, I had a look at Thrift. That looked very promising, but for example, in order to transmit numeric values, the Thrift folks uh, decided to have sort of variable length integers. So if you use the, the, the least most significant seven bits of a, a byte, uh, that is sort of like a, a one byte big uh, integer, but as soon as the topmost bit is one, they add another byte to it uh, with the same procedure. If the topmost bit is one, well, it adds another byte. Problem is, for example, in the S7 protocol, we need to transmit the code FF for OK. So as soon as I added FF, well, it added another byte. So it would have been hacking all over the place. And it was just like this for all other uh, approaches that I had to look at. The only one that was different was uh, Apache Daffodil. That sort of... Um, a completely different uh, type of framework. It's a framework where you describe uh, your data format in an XML-like uh, structure that is highly uh, inspired by XML schema. So I think the the actual syntax is a sub part of XML schema. Um, that was actually where I was able to sort of model the the, the data structures that went on the wire. But the problem was it wasn't generated code, it was pure interpretation, and therefore it was just too slow. And beyond that, well, I thought, well, being XML, well, doing code generation from that shouldn't be that difficult, but the community uh, wasn't too happy with uh, an XML-like uh, or XML schema type of uh, syntax, um, so we decided to do something differently. Um, and what we did was... Uh, well, we created something called MSpec. Um, and, and it was quite interesting how this uh, came to be because uh, I was just so frustrated after uh, all of these attempts and none of them really got me far uh, that one of our, uh, I think Julian uh, said, ah, stop whining about uh, all of this stuff, just write your own. Or just write it down on text, just write a text file how you would sort of define um, uh, define what you want to define, and then we'll just implement the parsers and the, the, the rest. Uh, well, and that's what we did. So um, it was highly inspired by Daffodil, well, mainly because that was the one thing that got me uh, uh, the farthest till then. Um, but in contrast, it's a text-based format for describing uh, the message structure, but in addition to that, also provide all the information that you need 
to generate parsing and serialization. Uh, we implemented the parser with AntLR4, and uh, well, uh, I would be super happy if somebody with uh, really cool uh, AntLR4 uh, skills would uh, sort of pop by and just have a look at that, because I think we can improve that quite a bit. Um, and the code is generated currently with FreeMarker. We have uh, generation templates for Java, C, and Go. Um, I also uh, have uh, some C Sharp uh, code generation in a branch, and the the project is planning and starting to get uh, started on um, working on Python code generation. Um, AntLR4 and FreeMarker, those are just options. Uh, so this is sort of the reference implementation that I built. Um, you could be free to sort of use whatever code generation or, or output uh, format you, you want, uh, or you could even uh, implement different parsers. Um, here's a little example. Uh, so this is the topmost packet in an S7 communication. It's a TPKT packet. Um, but the interesting thing is, well, this is sort of the, the, the type, uh, the type name, uh, and it consists of four fields. Um, one of them is a constant field called protocol ID, and it's always expected to be OX03. Um, after that, the, the, the vendor sort of said, oh, well, maybe we need some flags here. Um, so they added a reserved uh, byte. Um, you can see here, um, the, the we, we, we specify uh, the, the field types. Uh, it's an unsigned 8-bit integer. Uh, so in this case, uh, we expect this to be just zero or not used. Now comes something quite interesting, because I said we, we provide all the information needed for parsing and serializing, and this is what happens with the, the length field. So it's a 16-bit unsigned integer. Um, but the cool thing is, this is information that can be derived from the data structure itself. You don't have to manually calculate and store that. Uh, so the formula with which the system can uh, find out uh, itself is sort of like, just have a look at the payload, ask it for its length and bytes, and add four to that. Um, and last not least, we have uh, the CoTP packet payload. This is a simple, um, a simple uh, field. This means that um, uh, simple fields are you can think of simple properties. If you're if you're thinking in Java, it's just the the, the properties of your POJO that's generated by these. A little more complex example uh, because. This is something that you see all over the place. So usually you have in these binary protocols, you have some field that tells the parser what type uh, is coming, and then it parses things differently. And in this case, uh, you can see uh, we have here, it's sort of like a, a calculated field, the, the header length. Um, and then comes something called TPDU code. It's an uh, unsigned uh, in uh, 8-bit integer, um, and here we name things discriminator. And the thing is, this is a field that directly decides on the type uh, of uh, the, the, the object. So there's actually no need to store that because you can sort of get, if you've got an object and you want to serialize that, well, you just ask it for its discriminators and uh, you can output that value. It's sort of like a shortcut for an implicit value. And the interesting thing now is the type switch. So as soon as you've got a discriminated type, you need at least a type switch. And uh, only if you've got a type switch can you use discriminators. So in this case, we're passing the TPDU code uh, to the type switch. So uh, this is now compared to these case statements. So if the TPDU code is uh, OXF0, well, then we've got a CoTP packet data. Uh, if it's uh, OXE0, uh, um, well, then it's a CoTP packet connection request. And well, depending, if it's now F0, well, then it reads, reads one bit as end of transmission and the remaining seven bits of that byte as a TPDU ref. Yeah, so. That's sort of like a very quick introduction into MSpec, but now I just want to show you very briefly what our code generation framework generates from that. So this is a little example uh, that we built for Go. 
um, I took the TPKT packet um, as an example because uh, I just showed you uh, the data structure. You remember the protocol ID that was a constant? Well, we generate all of these as constants, and you can see the, the, the OX3 here. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so here comes the, the, the actual structure, and I said it's, it's, it only has one simple uh, property in there called uh, payload. Uh, and this is of type uh, CoTP packet. Um, the next interesting thing is every message has uh, this uh, interface that provides length in bytes, length in bits, and uh, you have a serialized method that you can use to serialize that to its binary form. Um, we automatically generate uh, the, the constructors, let's call them. We have these little utilities to cast. Uh, this is sort of a speciality of Go because uh, if you have subtypes, well, casting to that is sometimes a bit tricky, so we just generate this code automatically. Um, you can see, uh, well, the length and bits, it's sort of like... Uh, um, we, we need that because there are some protocols for which it's uh, important if this is the last element. Um, so uh, we, we have so-called parser arguments, and if you use them, they are automatically uh, added here. Um, so what happens here is, uh, based on the M spec, we just calculate how big this, uh, this data packet will actually be. So we have this 8-bit uh, unsigned uh, value uh, of const, then we had this 8-bit um, reserved field. Uh, as you can see, we just sum up uh, all of the sizes and return them uh, to the application. Now, oh, well, the length of bytes, as you can guess, it's sort of a convenience method because sometimes the size and bytes matters, but usually PLC4X uses the length and bits because there are crazy protocols that have sort of like four-bit big uh, messages. Uh, this is sometimes a bit annoying, but well. Uh, now we come to the, the actual parser. Uh, as you can see, um, we, we have these read buffers and write buffers that allow reading a, a variable number of bits uh, from uh, an input. Uh, as you can see here, we're reading, um, we're reading 8 bits um, into an uint8 um, in uh, Go. Um, reading the protocol idea here, we're comparing it uh, to uh, the, the value that we expected. Um, here we have a reserve field, and in contrast to that, as you can see here, if the protocol ID doesn't match, we'll, we'll throw an error. Uh, but uh, for reserve fields, we never knew if some in the future some company will start using these fields, um, and so it would really suck if our drivers would just break. So we decided for reserved fields, if the reserved field doesn't match the expected value, well, we just simply log that, hey, um, we just encountered that this is uh, sort of different than what we expected. So um, maybe it's worth investigating what the, what's different. You can see here the implicit field. Um, when reading, uh, we, we read this like every other field, but the thing is, we just store it as a local variable. Uh, and uh, I think later down, uh, yeah, here in the next uh, lines, you can see that we can then simply reference it. Um, yeah, so implicit fields, when parsing, they just sort of initialize local variables. Um, and when serializing, uh, they, they uh, have the code that we uh, put in the serialization expression. Here we have the, the simple field payload um, that sort of just forwards to the uh, CoTP packet parse uh, function uh, of uh, that type. Yeah, uh, serialization is uh, similar, just the other way around. So in this case, we just write an unsigned int uh, 8 bits uh, and we write this value. Uh, I already noticed that we could actually reference the the, the constant in this case. Uh, the reserve field, well, it just outputs the value. Uh, the implicit field, as you can see, uh, I think uh, two slides uh, earlier, you can see this payload length in bytes plus four. Well, this is what we have uh, here. Where, where are we? Implicit field. Yeah, here we are. Payload length in bytes plus four. Uh, in Go, we have to do this insane casting because if you don't cast the right 
way on every step uh, you really get uh, into trouble so I just created the code generator to just cast to everything on every level. Um, here you can see um, the payload uh, has a serialized method we just write past the right buffer and it sends things out. Um, yeah, so that much for generating Go, go code. Uh, for C, I'll just jump through this because uh, sort of I'm already running a little late. Uh, but as you can see, for C, we're generating a header file that has sort of the, the, the data structure. Um, and uh, then it has the what we had in Go, the interface, the, the, the parse, the, seri the serialize, uh, the get length in bytes, the get length in bits. We have all of that in C2. Uh, and the implementation comes uh, in the C file. Uh, where we have the constants again, we have uh, the parse method. It looks similar, but yeah, well, as C is different than Go, well, here we allocate some memory. Uh, here we do uh, a lot of uh, pointer passing around. Um, the methods, I have been told, uh, are, uh, well, insanely long, but we decided to simply stick with that because that's actually code no user would ever uh, encounter. Uh, and it's only used inside the drivers and uh, we decided to rather uh, take this uh, option than to sort of shortening things and uh, then have uh, collisions so this way we're just on the safe side um, but I think if we're just scrolling through this uh, all of this code is uh, generated automatically uh, and it works really really nicely so now we have code generated for our serializers, our parsers, our models, but testing them is something uh, something different because, well, uh, if we're sort of handwriting these drivers, uh, well, we would be generating most of the, of the drivers, but we would be hand implementing most of the tests. So um, I also knew that we need sort of a portable uh, unit test framework um, so uh, that's what uh, what um, what I built with this little thing. Um, you specify messages in an XML format, and it contains sort of the binary input, um, which is then par uh, passed to the parser. Um, it parses the input and produces a, a model, which we then serialize to an XML form and compare that to the reference one in the test. And only if this matches, uh, then we will take the parsed object again and serialize it uh, into its binary form and compare it to the original one. And with this, we have a full round trip to see if our serializers and parsers uh, really uh, match up. Um, this is a little example. Um, here we have a, a CoTP uh, connection request. Uh, this is uh, the, the binary input that we would be seeing on the wire. Uh, we tell the test to use a TPKTP TP, uh, TP packet um, for parsing this, and we're expecting uh, it to produce this output. Um, if that works, well, then it's serialized back again, and uh, we check if it matches uh, what we sent in uh, to start with. Uh, with this, uh, this works on uh, Java, on Go. Uh, on C, it's sort of tricky because, uh, well, let's say, uh, serializing stuff to XML in C without using any uh, external libraries, uh, that is a huge challenge. And uh, let's say the ecosystem for tools that can help you with writing such a thing is, uh, yeah, uh, almost non-existent. Um, so my plans are to sort of automate this um, by generating code, sort of like generating the handwritten code, um, but that's still something um, I need to do in the future. Or maybe maybe someone in the community can help with this. But And let's say in the plc 4 community, um, the, the number of people willing to get their fingers that dirty is sort of uh, a bit limited. Um, but that's not all we have because, uh, uh, well, that just tests the serializers and parsers, and, well, let's say drivers, as you, as I, you could see in the beginning where I had this little diagram, uh, is a bit more complex. Uh, so we also have an integration test framework. And this is 
similar to the unit test framework, so it's also XML based, but it uses the complete driver. Uh, and we use that to um, simulate a complex interaction. We have set up steps that need to initialize the driver into the correct state. Uh, and uh, the unit test then accepts sort of, we simulate an API request sent to the driver. This is then processed by the driver. We intercept the uh, IO uh, at the end um, and uh, sort of consume what the driver produces and we send back in what we want it uh, to have as a response. Uh, and in the end, we expect that the driver will respond with an API response and then we just check that. Um, here's a little example. Uh, wherever I have these uh, three dots, just please excuse me. Uh, there, just imagine a huge block of XML coming here. Uh, but what you can see in front of every uh, test that we run, well, we have to sort of, uh, first of all, send a CoTP connection request. Then we have to receive the response to that. Then we have to send a connection request. Then we have to receive the response. Then we have to um, ask uh, for what, what type of S7 are you? And then we have to interpret the response to that. Um, so as soon as we, we reach here, um, the driver is expected to be in the state that we want in order to execute the test. In this case, well, it's just a single um, element read request. Uh, the API request says, yeah, well, send a read request with these fields. Um, this is sort of like just the alias. Uh, well, Hutz, uh, the, the German-speaking uh, folks here might get the reference. Um, and uh, please use this address. And what happens now is the driver will produce binary output. If parsed, uh, it should match this uh, structure. Uh, so it's compared with that. If that matches, well, it takes this data structure and just serializes that to its binary form and passes that into the, to the driver. Um, I'm just scrolling by all of this. Um, so as soon as we passed in the, the, the response, well, then uh, we're expecting the driver to um, return with an API response. Uh, and uh, well, uh, our read request uh, had these uh, fields. Uh, and we're expecting it to have uh, the, the field hoods is uh, going to be expected to be a Boolean with a value true. Uh, and we're expecting it to have a state of OK. And if this matches, uh, well, then the test is green. And otherwise, well, we'll have in our test report, well, we'll just have a report that a single element read request failed. Yeah, and with this, we're really easy. it's really easy to get quite simple coverage uh, in your drivers over multiple languages. Um, and really looking forward to bringing this coverage to uh, C2. This is mostly manually tested. Um, but we have plans for generating more because uh, we still know there's quite, if you're, if you're mass producing drivers, well, there are things that are sort of becoming to get repetitive. Um, so the next thing will be uh, automatically generating the code for request and response interactions. So in all of these protocols based on you generate a request and depending on the values in the request, you expect a response and that's going to be of a certain type. And this is something, uh, especially in C, constructing these requests is sort of annoying. Um, and um, in other languages like Java and Go, it's not quite as bad, but, is it, but it's still sort of uncool and it would be cool if I had some sort of factory where I could say, well, give me a connection, a CoTP connection request and it would simply produce a CoTP connection request. I pass in all the arguments that sort of need to be customized in that um, request. And it also uh, produces everything that I need to handle the response to this request. So all I have to do is pass to the driver, well, please uh, run this interaction. Uh, and that will greatly, again, simplify uh, things a lot. You can think of uh, in these uh, state diagram that I had in the beginning, this will always be this request and response tuple. But what, what, what in the end we really want to do is create a state machine um, that, uh, where we can specify the, the logical structure of such a uh, protocol. And with this, we should be able to sort of like probably get up to 98% of uh, the code generated. Um, I already did something like that with uh, Daffodil. So I used SCXML uh, 2.0 in conjunction with Daffodil 
And I really managed to write an S7 driver that was able to communicate with a real device just using two XML files as input. Well, unfortunately, it was unbelievably slow. Um, so, but, but it was interesting what's possible. Speaking of embedded, uh, when it comes to embedded, well, one thing that matters probably most is size. Um, and uh, all of these different languages have their advantages advantages and disadvantages. And let's say, let's have a look. Well, we started with Java drivers, but if you just take an, uh, if you want to create a little application that um, does S7 communication, well, in Java, you can expect some 10 to 15 megabyte big jar thing. Um, but that wasn't the focus of, of Java. With uh, Java, we concentrated on a maximum performance and functionality and um, comfort for our users. Uh, because usually, let's face it, uh, if you've got sort of 46 gigabytes of RAM and uh, ter multiple terabytes of hard disk, well, the size of the drawer really doesn't matter that much. Um, if, if size really matters, um, and that was one thing I did in 2020 uh, uh, as part of, as a, of a U, uh, EU um, funded uh, research project, the C drivers, they had sort of the like complete different focus. Uh, so I built them with minimum resources in mind. So these C drivers, I think the C driver currently uh, comes uh, something near 100 to 200 kilobytes, not megabytes, um, and it's sort of intended for being run on these uh, STM32 sized devices. Um, um, it works with almost uh, no external dependencies, so it's not like uh, we're used to that, sort of you have to pull in uh, loads and loads and loads of third-party libraries. This works with, I think, only the core library and nothing else. Um, and it works on single-threaded devices, because uh, when I started this little project, uh, I, I, I was focusing on uh, getting it to run on Apache Minute. Uh, and that is sort of built for not uh, run, for running on non-POSIX systems. So uh, this, the C drivers, they work great on single-threaded devices, but you can also use them on multi-threaded devices. The Go drivers are sort of the, the compromise between all of them. Um, they, they're getting sort of the most performance uh, on embedded, but let's say, um, I'm running them on uh, sort of 32-bit MIPS uh, systems, 32-bit ARM uh, systems, even 46-bit ARM systems. Um, so everything Raspberry Pi and sort of uh, some edge routers, um, the Go drivers are um, working nicely on. And I think uh, also if, you, if you're spinning up loads and loads and loads of containers, like for example in EdgeX Foundry, uh, well, I think the Go drivers will definitely be... Uh, the best uh, sort of sweet spot between uh, performance, size, and uh, features. Yeah, so speaking of which, um, I had a look at the Linux Foundation uh, projects because I really would love to see some more uh, interaction uh, between all of our cool um, um, foundations. Um, and so what I came up with, well, in the Edge, EdgeX Foundry, of course, that was sort of the first uh, that I got in contact with at the OSS Summit in Edinburgh uh, some uh, years ago. Um, there, I, I was a little sad when they told me, well, we don't do Java, but yeah, well, now we don't only do Java, so I think the Go containers would be a huge asset for uh, the uh, industrial IoT communication part. Um, um, uh, and as far as I could see uh, on the website, uh, EdgeX Foundry sort of lists up all of the interesting drivers that, for example, plc for uh, x has to offer uh, in the section commercially available device services through community members. So those are the, the, the pay-to-play uh, parts uh, with plc for x in there. You, they, they would be uh, as free as the rest. Um, LF Edge. Um, I had a look at a pretty uh, interesting uh, project, but uh, all I could see was that I think the, 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 the project has OPC UA and IEC 104 drivers on board, um, and it says others via a commercial uh, fog lamp project. Um, I had a look at that, and uh, all the um, protocols that I explicitly saw named there was OPC UA and Modbus. So um, 
with PLC for X in here, I think uh, this also would be a huge asset for the project. Um, home Edge, um, I have to admit, I didn't quite uh, understand how in the end data was uh, actually uh, gonna be um, received into this Home Edge uh, system. Um, but a quick full text search uh, told me, uh, well, KNX and BuckNet and Modbus, well, that's sort of not a, a topic at the moment. So I'm expecting that, well, if you want to talk to, if you want to integrate your home automation systems into Home Edge, uh, well, you will definitely need drivers. And well, we have KNX, BuckNet, Modbus. We have, we have all of this uh, cool stuff that, that would uh, enable uh, the project to really directly talk to the, the systems. Automotive grade Linux. Um, well, we, we, uh, starting with version 090, uh, we're shipping our first uh, set of CAN bus drivers. Uh, of course, uh, if somebody tells me he's got a car and he's running automotive grade Linux uh, on it and uh, he told me, yeah, and I'm using your CAN bus driver to sort of like control uh, how much the gas pedal is pressed, well, I would really get nervous and ask him to get out of his car. But we also have passive mode drivers, so just simply listening to all of the tel telemetry on the car, bus, that might be something uh, that could be interesting for this project. Um, one of the projects that I'm actually using most recently, uh, Yocto. Um, I could imagine that uh, for the Yocto project, it would be quite interesting to sort of um, have a, a layer that you can sort of uh, bring in uh, to, to automatically have a, sort of an OPC UA or MQTT bridge. Um, so you just simply have to get one of these little embedded devices, uh, build your firmware with a Yocto, add the plc for x uh, OPC UA server layer, and you can talk to your uh, legacy um, Modbus uh, controllers via uh, OPC UA. Uh, I think this might even be the part that I could that I would feel comfortable with whipping up myself. But with all of the others, uh, the, the, the problem is usually that um, getting to learn how a project is set up and how it works, that's the actual hard part. Uh, and I have learned in the past that uh, whenever I built an integration uh, for a community that I thought it was interesting, um, only the the, the communities themselves actually know what is needed. Uh, only the communities uh, know the best practices, uh, how something is implemented best. I mean, all of the integration modules we have, they have been improved uh, over time, but I know that I wasted a lot of time by simply trying to do something that I didn't understand and I could really use some help. Uh, so if any of you folks uh, from any of these projects or even ones I didn't mention are interested in integrating plc for x into your project, please reach out to us. Uh, we're more than willing to help. So let's join forces. Okay, spoiler, I already mentioned most of this. Um, yeah. So, as I, as I mentioned, um, if you're interested in something like this, just reach out to us. Um, if you want to do that, well, you can contact me directly on, well, Twitter, LinkedIn, or, well, the internet usually tells you pretty easily how to reach me. Or, what would be even better would be to sign up to our mailing list. Um, maybe even create pull requests, even if I would actually say that most of the integration modules for LF um, Edge uh, projects or Linux Foundation projects, I would probably rather see on the side of uh, the Linux Foundation because uh, I think it integrates better with your uh, ecosystems. Um, things that really help the project is uh, talking about plc x publicly because the industry sort of is totally paranoid about sharing what they're doing on their shop floors. Uh, so we know Really, a lot of big companies are using plc for x but nobody's actively talking about it. And this sort of brings us into this situation where, yeah, well, who uses it? Yeah, lots of people. Uh, so who uses it? Uh, yeah, well, we can't tell you. Um, either we're not allowed to, or it's not, they, they never officially um, uh, sort of mention it. Uh, another thing you could do is uh, follow uh, the Apache plc for x uh, project on Twitter. Uh, there are project mascot handles uh, its uh, channel quite nicely. Uh, yeah, so I hope this was interesting for you. And uh, yeah, 
I really hope on seeing some of you uh, soon uh, in person or on our mailing list. Uh, well, I have to admit, having a few beers with you guys would be definitely uh, what I would enjoy most right now. But, yeah, again, thanks for having me, and, yeah, see you soon.